What is a private professional fiduciary? Maybe your estate planning attorney has recommended that you look into one to act as successor trustee or the manager of your revocable trust when you're gone or your child's special needs trust. But you have no idea how a private fiduciary might be able to help you and your family. Well, in today's video, I interview Shannon Downs, who is a private professional fiduciary in the Sacramento, California area. Shannon runs a fiduciary company. I often think that private fiduciaries are a really good choice as successor trustee of a trust. In this interview with Shannon, you'll find out exactly why they can be so good with this role. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. So I want you to tell us what, what is a private fiduciary? So many times I, I introduce this concept to my clients, especially clients who don't have a successor trustee for the special needs trust for their child lined up. And mm -hmm. I mention a private fiduciary and they go, huh? What's that? So if you can give us kind of a summary of what it is you do, that would be awesome. Oh, thanks for asking. So a lot of times people hear the word fiduciary and they instantly think that we are financial advisors. And that's actually not true, but we do work with financial advisors in some of the different roles that we play. So a, a fiduciary is sort of an umbrella term for someone who acts in a position of authority for someone else. So for instance, I can serve as a trustee. I could serve as a power of attorney for healthcare or finance. I can serve as a conservator. I can also do bill pay for someone and help them in those regards. So it's a very broad term, but it just means someone who is in a position of trust and authority to fill in for someone else when maybe they don't have a family member or friend who normally they would choose to do that for them. What a great role. I mean, that is so needed nowadays. And there's so many people I know, especially we're in the Bay Area, and so many people move here from other states, from other countries. They don't have trusted family members. Maybe they're the first people, the first generation in their family to really do well financially. And, and they need somebody like you who they can trust. So tell me a little bit about you, Shannon. How did you get involved in this field? Yeah, so I actually worked as a in the technical world. So I did trainings for judges and attorneys on a, some software back in my my first career, basically. And it was a really it was a great and fulfilling career. But at some point, I was looking for a change. And it, it sort of all happened at the same time, but my dad actually got ill and I had never, you know, been versed in how to care for someone who is, you know, of course my parent, but also just someone else who I had to then worry about, well, what their benefits were. And, you know, my dad had Medicare and what did, what covered, what was covered by Medicare? I mean, a lot of people that I talk to actually will say, and I actually had this conversation with a friend the other day. I said, does your mom have long-term care plan or anything? She lives with you. She said, no, she'll just go to the old folks home, right? And I said, oh gosh, no. So there were so many things. And I feel like I was sort of in her shoes in the beginning. And so I really didn't know much about what services there were for older people that were sick and needed help. And so it just sort of like was a very quick study on those types of things. And it really got me thinking that this is a big need for other people, especially my friends and other family members who could benefit from having someone who understands those types of, of things that they'll, they'll need and, and the process to go about getting help for them. So I, I started looking into it and started to do the coursework and, you know, you have to have a degree and you have to take the courses, you have to pass an exam. And so uh, I did all of that and, and got licensed in 2016. Wow. So that's, that's a little while that you've been doing this now. Yeah. Although sometimes it feels like I've just scratched the surface. I mean, it's, there's so many things to learn about assisting people in this, in this realm and um, learning all of the different processes and programs and things like that. It's, it's a lot, but it's very rewarding. I really enjoy doing it. Wow. That's so terrific. You know, that reminds me of so many people in our fields go into these fields because of personal experiences. I know a lot of special needs planners go into the field because they have a child who has disabilities. Like my son uh, has high functioning autism, 
although mm -hmm. I actually went into the field before he was diagnosed. So mm -hmm. it's just interesting, though, then you see the need and you think, how come nobody's doing this? How yeah. shouldn't I do it? Yeah. Well, so tell me, what are some of the most rewarding parts of, of this field? I bet there's a lot of really great things uh, that you get to do, but, but share yeah. with me even some stories of ways that you really feel like you've helped people. Yeah, well, you know, a, a lot of people come to me when they either they don't have anyone nearby, like you were saying, I have a lot of same sex couples that I work with who as they get older, they have no one to help them. And they have nieces and nephews, maybe or friends and things like that. But they are really concerned about being burdens. And so it's really nice, because you get to help them. And they understand that, you know, that this is fulfilling to me and I'm here to help them and I have a fiduciary duty to put their needs first and and so it's I, I think I feel good about helping be that security blanket for them knowing that their their needs are taken care of somebody is watching out for them it's just it's a very rewarding field and you know just other family members unfortunately I've come into situations where there were family members that were being taken advantage of by other people so I was able to come in and help sort of stop that situation, get them protected, make sure that they were in a good place financially and physically and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I've always, I'm, I'm an older sister in my family and I have that very protective nature about me where I want to help and protect those who can't maybe fend for themselves. And so that's always been sort of a, the most rewarding part of my job and, and being in those types of roles. So there's just so many, as you were talking about, you know, family members that live far away from one another, or maybe, you know, they don't have anyone anymore. And so filling in in that role is, has been really a great, great adventure for me and, and a wonderful, fulfilling career. How terrific. Shannon, the protector. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try. <laughs> well, so let's talk a little bit about timing. So when would someone actually bring a private fiduciary like you into the picture? How does that work? Well, generally, it's once they've started talking with their attorneys about putting their, their uh, estate plans together, uh, or they've been talking to their financial advisor, uh, maybe that they've noticed that they don't have a trust plan together yet, so they start talking to them about that. So once they've sort of started that process, usually their attorney or someone will tell them, oh, you should talk to a professional fiduciary about serving as your successor trustee or something. And so what they'll do is hopefully they'll get a list of names of people that they can call. And once we do, so we'll do an interview, generally a free 30 minute interview. I'm, I know a lot of other fiduciaries do the same, you know, a little get to know ya. And then what we'll do then is if they do decide that they want to have a serve in some role like that, then we'll have them fill out a client. Uh, information questionnaire, and then we'll start gathering information about them and making a profile. And all of that really is just in preparation. So once we have all that together, then what we'll do is we will, from that point on, we'll actually once a year, then after we've gotten all the information and we'll send them a scope of engagement letter so they know that we're retained. And then so basically from that point on, we're just sort of waiting to see if they need our help. Because those documents that you guys put in place for them, they're really only valid until they actually either exercise an option to bring us on board immediately, or they're found incapacitated by doctors, or if they do pass away. So those are the triggers that bring us in. But we also do a, a one-year check-in with all of our clients where we'll just either call them or send them an email to just check in and see how things are going, but really nothing starts until there's an event or there's a need. So we're just sort of here waiting in the wings for, for that signal. That's, that's a good description. You know, I think yeah. about somebody, you know, waiting to go on stage, they're, they're kind of <laughs> waiting, right? Yeah. Well, so let's talk money. So how do you, how do you get paid? What, what do the fees look like? So it does vary, but generally most fiduciaries will charge an hourly rate. And that really doesn't kick in until they actually start doing something for you. Uh, and it, depending on where you are, I know different parts of California, they charge different things just based on cost of living. In my area, which is the Sacramento region, it's about 120 to about 150 an hour. And that's an hourly rate. But like attorneys, we do bill at the increment of an hour. And that's really standard with most fiduciaries. There can be some fiduciaries that will charge by percentage, and that typically is with a higher wealth client, but generally we'll take 
most any case, I mean, there is no minimum of, of their assets, just granted, we need to be able to have enough to actually do something. But at that point, though, we do just charge by the hour. And we don't start billing till we work and we do bill against the estate. So we would then pay ourselves, which, you know, does sound a little funny, but we'll pay ourselves out of the estate. But we do submit that and all of our records in a full accounting to all of the beneficiaries. So everything is very transparent and they can see, you know, what we've billed and what we've what we've taken out. But generally, it's just what we need to do to get the job done. That definitely makes sense. And I mean, you're a professional, so you should be paid for and and also I think you would be so much more efficient than someone who's doing this for the first time and you know every time you try something for the first time it takes like three times longer you know so you've yeah. you've, you've been around the block and have, have done this uh, quite a bit and and the other thing that you mentioned that really stands out to me is that there isn't really a minimum assets uh, you know like they have to have enough to to pay you but it's not like a lot of banks, they require that you have a minimum of a million dollars, you know, for them to manage that. So I think a, a private fiduciary can be a really good option for someone who might have a more modest estate, but still needs all of the help, would you say? Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, and we handle everything and, and just like, you know, say a, a, a bank's trust company would. But, you know, I think it's more of a personal touch. We get to know the family, too, before potentially because of the interviews and then the back and forth throughout the years. but. We do handle everything, the personal property, we do the final taxes, if it's an estate closure, a full accounting, you know, sell property, liquidate things. So it is a lot. And like you said, I mean, for someone who's never done it before, it doesn't mean that they can't. I mean, you know, usually they'll get the help of an attorney and, and we do hire experts as well. So that's part of it. I mean, we have a CPA do the final taxes. We have an accountant do the final accounting. We have a realtor sell the house. We work with financial advisors to liquidate uh, assets. So, you know, we have a quite a big network of people that we work with, but it's all for the benefit and to close the estate. So it, it is a lot, but, you know, we do it quite often and, and we're getting a little bit more efficient at it with each one. <laughs> of course. Well, you're kind of the quarterback, right? You're kind of seeing like, because you have so many people at your disposal. And I think that's another uh, that's some value that you bring to the table is, is knowing a lot of other service professionals who specialize in certain things so you can really put together a great team. And, you know, that really comes in handy too when we're working with our elderly and disabled clients who need services. And so sometimes I start working for some of my clients that maybe have named me just as a successor trustee for when they pass. I mean, we'll start working together several years prior because maybe they slow down, they're not able to keep up with the bills anymore, maybe they're having some cognitive issues. So we can come in at you know any time and help them assess things and then oversee caregivers in the home. We can oversee them getting rides, making sure that they're getting meals, their houses are getting cleaned, you know, that they're safe in their home. So you know, we do kind of run the gamut as far as our network, not just in closing an estate, but just really all around taking care of, of our clients. So it's a lot. Wonderful. Wow. Now, so, so a lot of our clients, they're looking for someone who can be successor trustee of, let's say, a child special needs trust. And so they're going to be around longer than, I'm sure you're going to live a long time, right? But, <laughs> but they'll be around even longer. So tell me about succession planning. How can somebody plan if, if you're not there anymore, if, you know, hopefully you'll retire at some point, or, or maybe you'll say, oh, this isn't for me. I'm, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you, you never know. know. That'll happen. Crazy. You never yeah. know, right? Yeah. So, so what suggestions would you give in that situation? Well, so it, absolutely. And it is very important to have those people backed up as well, because you don't know what is going to happen in life. And so what I usually recommend to people who've named me is, you're gonna be interviewing other fiduciaries as well. And what I would recommend is you choose those that you feel comfortable with, get to know them and have them in line as successors to one another. Now I do, I and other fiduciaries like me probably have some people that are learning under us and eventually will get their fiduciary licenses. And we hope so because we need more and more. But in the meantime, what I, I would recommend is, is research and find those others that you feel comfortable with. And if the fiduciary that you've named do eventually have someone that they feel comfortable 
providing to the name to their clients to take over should they not be able to, then during that yearly check-in, that's a great time for me to let my clients know what my plans are ahead of time to let them know that maybe I'm going to retire or something. And then they could then just leave their plan the way it is with the next person and the next person, or they could change it with a recommendation from me. But really, only we can serve for them if our name is in a document. I really can't hand it off to someone else. It's very similar to like a, a doctor or a dentist or someone where you're getting that service from them, but they can't necessarily tell you who to go to, right? To, to provide services to you. They can maybe recommend, they can say, oh, I'm going to retire in the next year. And I'm recommending my clients contact this particular professional. It's very similar in, in our line of, of work, but our names are in those documents and the banks will only work with us if our names are in there. So you need to make sure that you have those successors listed there too, so that they can fill in if we can't in, in an emergency or something too. Well, that, that makes sense. And yes, banks are quite particular, aren't they? <laughs> Very much so. In this field, we, we all experience that. So this is all such, such valuable information. Is, is there anything else that you think would be really helpful as somebody is thinking about hiring a private fiduciary? Anything else that, that they should consider? I just want to yeah, well, I would say that make sure that one, that you feel very comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it would be best if they were close by. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, right next door. But if you're going to name someone, say, as your power of attorney for health care, I'd say that would be some, some uh, instance where you would want to really focus in on those that are nearby just because they're going to potentially have to be there for you should there need to be any decisions made, being in contact with your doctors, things like that. But for the most part, we can handle things from afar. But I would say that would be the one area where I would say make sure that you have someone and whoever you name, whether it's a professional fiduciary or not, make sure that if you name someone to make those medical decisions for you, that they're close by you know, and that you trust them and that you've given them all of your instructions and things like that, because we really are there to serve what you want, not what we want. And we want to make sure that we have those proper instructions and that we have all of the different tools for us to succeed, meaning being nearby, knowing where everything is for you, having all that pertinent information. So make sure that you share all that too, with the people that are going to be stepping in for you, because that's really important. Yeah, I've heard a lot of successor trustees really appreciate a, a memo of intent. Just kind oh, of yes. a, yeah, an informal letter of this is this is all about my kid and this these are the things you should know. You like those? We do. Anything we can get our hands on to help give us just that little bit more insight into what that person's intentions were or what they were thinking because we are making decisions as if we were them and you know, although we do our best maybe there could be some additional resources for us. And so if there's anything they can leave that would be an additional bit of information, we'll take it. <laughs> Terrific. All right, so my last question. So did you see the movie, I Care A Lot? Oh no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any oh, thoughts? Is that, is that totally spot on or what? Oh boy. <laughs> You know, I will say there are probably horror cases out there, most likely not dealing with fiduciaries, but it's usually the family members, one, that do those horrible things. And the other thing I would say is that those that court system looked just ridiculous. There are so many more checks and balances. Something like that really would never happen, but never say never. But I would just say that, yeah, if anything, it got our names out there in a very bad way, but at least people now maybe, oh yeah, I think I saw about that or something. So maybe that's just giving us a little bit more of a spotlight, but I think, you know, hopefully there'll be something better put out there eventually. You know, maybe we should make a movie or something. Yeah, we should do a documentary. Put us in a better light. <laughs> I like that idea. I know. And I feel like it has to be like colorful and sensational for yeah. people to be interested, but this is life. I mean, we yeah. deal with so many interesting situations every day. I, that's one thing that I love. I, I don't know what's coming in the door, you know, what situation and, and, you know, the more complex and interesting, the better, I think. So. Every family is so different and, yeah. you know, no family's perfect. There's always some strife or some problem, but, you know, 
we come in and the beautiful part is we are a neutral third party, you know, so are you when you drop these documents. I mean, we're just here to help serve them. We have no prior knowledge or any history really with these people. And so we're just there to do our best, but that every family's got their issues. So, you know, people should never feel bad. It's just the way it is. And I think that's another reason why bringing in someone who is a professional and someone who isn't related to all of that, that, you know, we do treat everyone exactly the same equals. And we make sure that, you know, we don't bring our own biases to it, that we come in and we just get the job done with, with the, the hope that we do a good job for the, for the family, for the people who put the, the trust documents together. Well, and it's clear that you're very compassionate with your, with your clients as well. You know, I, I like to think that we help set up parenting when you're gone. You know, when, <laughs> when a parent is gone, yeah. they still, a lot of our families still need extra parenting for their kids, whether it's financial or whether it's caregiving. And so that's what we're trying to establish. And I think that's why the, the connection with somebody is so important. Absolutely. And we do, we are sort of the the surviving parents, I guess, yes. that kind of carry on and, and oversee. And I have a number of those types of clients, actually, who they don't get the trust funds turned over to them until they're a bit older, 35 and 40, you know, and a couple of them came to me at 14. So we're going to have a long life together, but it's, it, and it's fun. I really enjoy it. And yeah, I do bring a lot of, you know, passion to it because I do really care about them. And I do feel like I have a bunch of extra kids now, you know, mm -hmm. you actually <laughs> do care a lot. <laughs> I do. I do. I'm I'm like Rosamund Pike. You do. Yes. Care a lot. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a great role. And, you know, we need more fiduciaries out there. Mm -hmm. There are not enough of us. We need more. Totally agreed. Wow. Well, thank you so much for serving our community in this way. And thanks for taking the time to, to stop by and, and, and talk to us. So thank you. Absolutely. You're so welcome. All right. Have a great one. Now you know more about how private professional fiduciaries can help your family with your estate planning needs. But maybe you have more questions about estate planning in general. I encourage you to click on this button below, which links to a webinar that I've done on estate planning basics, and you can learn all about estate planning for your family. Also, be sure to watch this video over here called Estate Planning Basics, What Do All the Terms Mean? There, I walk you through the different words that we use in the estate planning community, and I translate them into plain English. So I'll see you over there.